long, small-town Halloween nightmare is over. And after that deadly penultimate hour, the finale of Stranger Things 2 feels almost quiet, even accounting for the smoke monster exorcism. Where the last episode gave us frantic, fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants heroics, the gate straps on its goggles and makes a plan. Then, like Hopper, it pulls us back into another room and gives us the space to process our feelings. Of all those feelings, it's young love that book ends this finale. Eleven and Mike finally embraces Mike Channel's Ryan Gosling in the notebook I never gave up on you. I called you every night, but his relief turns to fury when Hopper admits to being the reason Al never responded. Hopper takes a boy into another room to let him vent in private. He asks Mike not to blame Eleven. Mike really doesn't. I blame you, he yells, punching the chief in the stomach and calling him a liar until he winds up crying in his arms. Previously, Chapter 8, The Mind Flayer When they rejoin the group, Eleven has already shunned Max You don't have to view other girls as threats, Elle, instead Will's message, close gate. She's sure she can close the same gate she opened before, which should the Mind Flayer's army, but as Mike points out, that army controls Will, meaning had too. How are they just now figuring this out? Joyce comes up with a solution, heat up her son's body until the Mind Flayer can't stand it anymore. Good thing Hopper has just the right obscure cabin in the woods for an amateur exorcism. Nancy, with Steve's blessing, goes with the Byers family to Hopper's cabin while Hop and Eleven set out for the lab, where they'll wait to close the gate until Jonathan radios that Will is monster-free. On the drive, Elle admits to visiting her mother, she leaves out the whole thing where she went to the big city and almost did someone, and Hopper apologizes to his punked-out runaway for being so hard on her. He was just afraid of losing her like he lost Sarah. Hopper seems surprised when Eleven asks who Sarah is. He's either startled that he mentioned his daughter or just surprised he hasn't mentioned her before. And given that he calls himself a black hole it sucks everything towards it and destroys it before saying the black hole is what got her, it's clear he's working through some guilt tied to his daughters. But Eleven grabs his hand she's back bitch a new look and all. While they rebuild, another family causes trouble. Billy, after flirting with Mrs. Wheeler, has found his way to the buyer's home, where he shoves Lucas against the wall and punches Steve to a pulp. Max thinks on her feet, grabs a syringe full of whatever they've been using to knock out Will, and stabs her stepbrother in the neck. Max has been a mixed bag as a new character she's played well into this season's exploration of the need for connection, but she hasn't done much for the plot. Billy, though, is worse, an empty aggressor for aggression's sake, which is especially noticeable on a show that validates young people's anger, as Hopper did with Mike. His father's violence helps explain Billy's rage, but it isn't excuse how he expresses it. Which is why it's so satisfying when Max grabs Steve's nail bat and brings it down inches from her stepbrother's crotch, demanding that he leave her and her new friends alone. As Billy sinks into unconsciousness, Max grabs his keys. She and the boys aren't content to sit on the bench, so they've hatched a plan to help Elle by setting fire to the hub of the Shadow Monster's tunnels, drawing the demodogs away from the lab. Responsible babysitter Steve objects to this plan, but responsible babysitter Steve is now out cold, leaving Max who has driven in a parking lot, which Lucas says still counts to show for the group. In the hour's funniest scene, Steve wakes up in the back seat of a speeding car, surrounded by middle schoolers who baby him. Hey, buddy, shush, dust and coos. It's okay. You put up a good fight. After Max somehow manages to steer everyone to the hole Hopper dug into the tunnels, Steve accepts that there's nothing he can do to stop the kids from helping Eleven, so he changes tactics and takes the lead. When they get to the hub, he flicks his lighter. The tunnel goes up in flames. The chain reaction is immediate. The demodogs blocking Hopper and Eleven's route to the gate all flock to the tunnels. In Hopper's cabin, Will, whose veins have gone black as space heaters and a fireplace burn him from every side, screams out a trail of smoke. He wakes up as Will again, freed from the last of the Mind Flayer we hope, and the Byers family enjoys a well-earned group hug. Steve and the kids book it out of the tunnel, slipping past Dart after Dustin plies him with nougat. At least something good came out of his connection with the monster. Just as Steve is about to give Dustin a boost out of the tunnel, they're swarmed by demodogs on all sides, but the creatures aren't interested in them. Eleven is at the gate. It's time to end this. Hopper and Eleven descend into a pit and face down the gaping, glowing tear into the upside down. While Hopper picks off incoming demodogs with a rifle, Eleven focuses all of her powers and all of her pain, per callous advice, on the gate. At the memory of being torn from her mother for a lifetime of testing, she screams so righteously that she levitates a few inches above the ground. The gate knits itself back together. 
It's a satisfying affirmation of this young girl's right to be royally outraged, a full circle moment for a season that's seen 11 and will switch places in the narrative. While we'll actively push the plot forward, Eleven became the show's absent emotional heart, facing her demons and searching for her home. And if the story sometimes felt like it was wasting its best weapon by keeping her on the sidelines, it also honored her trauma, which becomes her weapon as she returns to save the day. Hopper wraps her in his arms, you did good, kid, recap continues on page 2.